So if you have your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, look down to verse 17. I really couldn't find a good spot to break in on this chapter without reading the entire chapter to you. So I'm going to break in there at 17, and uh, I'm going to read a few verses, so bear with me, please. The King James Version <clears throat> of the Bible says, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. He says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. And where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews, a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks, foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Of God because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men for you see your calling brethren how that not many wise men after the flesh many mighty not many noble are called but God hath chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise and God hath chosen the weak things of this world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world that things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are. That no flesh should glory in his presence, but of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom." and righteousness and sanctification and redemption that according as it is written he that glorieth let him glory in the Lord I want to talk to you for just a little bit of your time and, and I'll try to be as brief as possible but I, I still want to deliver this word to you it's somewhat unique a unique title but I want to share it with you anyway I'm going to talk to you about God's tool chest. God's tool chest. If you know anything about mechanics, or if you've got a mechanic, or most guys have some type of a tool chest, we call it toolbox, where I'm from anyway. And uh, we got a little bit of uh, uh, ingenuity when it comes to it. We know how to knock the hide off our knuckles. I mean, we're pretty good at that. But understanding a toolbox or a tool chest that's where you keep your instruments for work I want to talk to you about God's instruments and his tools amen I'm going to talk about you and I father I do need you I need you to anoint me like a man from another world uh, these are dark days these are troublesome times these are times where people even those who proclaim faith are struggling receiving your word. My prayer is that you will use this old vessel of clay to challenge someone's faith, that they believe stronger in you and they trust more in you. Let Jesus be glorified if anything is done well here. Let me get the credit if anything's wrong because you receive all the glory for all things in Jesus name amen you may be seated um, when you look at the Apostle Paul's writings uh, to the Corinthian church he starts out invoking his authority as an Apostle he is sharing with the church what he was called to do and a part of the purpose. He's dealing with issues in this church of Corinth 
Issues of division. Issues of, uh, uh, of just, uh, just putting it plainly to you, there was people who had differences in belief there. And they had uh, reasons for it. And, and look, I'm not trying to justify it, but they had reasons for their differences in their faith or in their belief. They were, they were loyal people. And they were loyal to those who had won them to the faith and had shared the gospel with them and who had baptized them. They were loyal to them. And so understanding a little bit about the book and, and about the reasoning for this writing helps us to get down to business because Paul was sharing this gospel message to say, look, you know, if you'll back up from where I began the, uh, the text, I started in verse 17, but if you'll back up four or five verses, Paul is saying, look, I'm glad I didn't baptize any of you because I don't want you to say that you're of my clan or of this one or that one because that's not what God wants. He said, what you're doing is you're becoming overcome with the wisdom of this world. And that head knowledge, that carnal knowledge you have, it's clouding your faith. And you see, what happens to many people is we'll, we'll get so knowledgeable about certain things that we don't even need faith. And that's not what God has called us to. Amen? He's called us to a faith. And you say, well, Pastor, why are you focusing so much on this? Because there are good people that God has placed his hand on in this church or in the church as a whole and I'm talking about worldwide, who feel like that they're not qualified or they're not capable of serving in ministry because of a lack of education or, um, uh, you know, the, the certain pedigrees, you know. I, I can't stand in this pulpit tonight and say I'm fifth generation Church of God preacher. There's nothing wrong with that, but I can't do that. I don't have those credentials. But what I have is, is I have an understanding that it's not about the degrees that hang on your wall. It's not about the eloquence of speech. It's not about the church or the clan quote that you come from. Amen? What it's about is, is understanding the God who calls you and who will use you if you will be available. Too often, um, and, and I'm only going to throw an old number at you, and I'm not this is not a complaint or an indictment at, at, of any type. I'm just giving you some numbers. Too often, 80% of the work in a gospel church is done by less than 20% of the people. And, 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 and I want you to understand this. God is not looking for just 20% of the people to do the yeoman's load of the, of the church. But He's looking for everyone in the body to become a functioning element of the body of Christ. Amen? He wants us to be a tool that He can use for His kingdom. Amen? And He puts us all together and amen. He uses us to, to work on and to help people uh, in their lives. Amen? And now, the, one of the, my favorite scriptures of Paul's writings comes from the text that I read to you tonight and it's verses 27 and 28 of 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Uh, the New American Standard Bible says, But God has chosen the foolish things of this world to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of this world to shame the things which are strong. And the base things of the world, and, and listen, and, has, and, and the despised, that those that despise God, has, He has chosen, listen, the things that are not so that He may nullify the things that are. What He's saying is, look, he's, God can use anybody that is willing to be used. And in fact, God chooses to use people that doesn't have certain pedigrees so that he will be sure to receive the glory, amen, from anything good that might come from that vessel. Now understand this. There's no way I can preach, teach, or, or share any type of a gospel message apart from the anointing of God. Now, I study, I prepare myself the best of my ability, and uh, I understand there's a lot more uh, people that are elo more eloquent, they're uh, more educated, and they can carry themselves in a pulpit far better than I can. But that, doesn't, that does not define 
who I am. What defines who I am is my availability to Christ and the calling that He's placed on my life. So what does that do for me? That, well, that gives me this assurance that no matter if they are people out there who's better or are more, quote, qualified, that I don't think there's anybody who's any more called. And I'm not saying that in a boastful way. I'm saying that as a reference. I can't talk about you. That's why I'm not talking about you, okay? I'm, I have to talk about myself because I know me. Does that make sense? So, and I know my calling. So wh what I'm saying is, is just because there's... And I, can I throw some names out there and it not be offensive? Just because there's a T.D. Jakes and just because there's a, 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 a Perry Stone and just because there's a Jensen Franklin and, and different uh, of your... Uh, more well-known names out there, it doesn't make you any less qualified to do gospel ministry. You know, the qualification comes from the one who has the tool in his hand. Come on. I, I've got a toolbox um, that I used when I was running a, a, a body shop uh, working on cars. And uh, I, I still have that toolbox, and I have a lot of those tools left. I didn't keep them all, but I have a lot of the tools that, uh, of the uh, quote of the trade. And so if it comes to uh, minor repairs on a car or something like that, I can do in my yard. I, I can just go out there and work on my own car, and I'm, 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 I'm good with that. And um, over the years of using those tools, I became acquainted with where they go. I became acquainted with what I need before I start the project. And when I get out there to start on the project, that tool, if I lay it down beside the car, it will not fix that car. Come on. It won't take it apart. It won't put it back together. It has to be in the hand of the mechanic or the, or, or the laborer before that tool is any good. And then I have found this out that no matter how great that tool is, if it's not in the qualified hands, it's not any good at all. What are you saying, Pastor? There's some people who dwell in, and depend so much on qualifications and, 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 and eloquence and so many things that they disqualify themselves for ever doing anything in God's kingdom. Please hear me. All you have to do is place yourself in the hands of the master. You may not look the part. You may not sound the part. You may not have the pedigree, but you hear me. It's all up to the master who has you in his hand. He knows where to place you. He knows how to use you. He knows, my, my, my. Oh, this is even going to preach. I never thought I'd preach out of the toolbox, but he knows where you fit. Amen? He knows where you will work the best. Some jobs I would take apart a car and I could use an air ratchet. I could pull the front end off a car in 15 minutes. Because I had an air ratchet and I knew, it, I knew right where to go with what tool. And I would lay it all out and I'd, and I'd just take it apart. Because I knew what fit. God knows where you fit. You have to learn to trust Him. Amen. You say, well, pastor, I'm not a Sunday school teacher. Well, great. If you're not a Sunday school teacher, be the best at wherever else God has you. Well, I'm not a gospel preacher. That's okay. You know, everybody's not called to this pulpit. Some who think they are never could handle it. No, I'm just saying, I, I couldn't do it if it wasn't for the master who has me in his hand. So don't get me wrong, I'm just saying what we have to understand is it's, it's, not, it's not so hard just to be who God has called you to be. Now, I, I, I don't want to come across as I've got some grudge or, or vendetta of coming here, but understand this. The one who calls you, his ways are different than ours. Let me talk to you about God's ways. Number one, God's way is perfect. To, in 1 Corinthians chapter number 1, Paul was discussing the problem that the Jews had and that the Greeks had. What did he say about them? He said, well, he says, because the foolishness of God is wiser than the men uh, and the weakness of God is stronger. 
if you'll back up, let me, let me find the verse right quick, okay? Uh, the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. It says, but we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews, and it's a stumbling block. And unto the Greeks, it's foolishness. Well, <laughs> though people may view God and His ways as antiquated and they do not work today, let me tell you people, please, let me tell you. God, though times and people change, His message will still work today. The, hey, the style, the dress, the whole thing may be different with the lights and everything. But let me tell you something. It, the message will never, ever change, and it will always work if used properly. Come on. His ways are perfect. Let me tell you what Psalms 18 and verse 30 says. Psalms 18 and verse 30 says, As for God, His way is blameless. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a shield to all who take refuge in Him. The first part of that, as for God, His way is blameless. That word means perfect. That's, the word is, is, is broken down from perfect to blameless. Now, if we understand this, and God's ways are perfect, and, and, and you've been arguing with him about, uh, or, or, or wrestling with him about your place in his kingdom, then why are you fighting? Why are you struggling? Why are you resisting him? His ways are perfect. I'm going to talk about me a little more. I argued so much with God about preaching. I said, God, there's other people who know your Bible far more than me, use them. Just take them. They'll, they'll, they'll be all right. I've heard them. They're pretty good. And with your help, they can do anything. Come on, Lord, you, 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 you use them. And I was resisting and I was fighting and, 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 and wrestling, trying to get away from it. But the more I understand that his ways are perfect, I quit dwelling and quit resisting and quit fighting and, and dealing with the turmoil of, uh, uh, and being just miserable. And I embrace it because I know His way is perfect. I don't always understand it. I, I, I don't sometimes, I, I, and I, this, this may be too much for y'all to handle, but I'm going to say it. Some days I don't even appreciate it. Because I'm thinking, God, are you sure? You know how this is going to turn out. <laughs> and are you sure about this? But what, what I have to do is I have to understand that His way is perfect. Also, I have to understand this about His ways. is His ways are nothing like man's ways. You know, it's easy to be uh, Monday morning quarterbacks, armchair quarterbacks, I've discovered the more you let people sit in their seats on the sidelines, the more likely they're to move to the press box and become critics. You watch football, you know what I'm saying. The guys who don't move up, they take jobs being analysts. And then they talk about what the guys on the field are doing or not doing or should be doing. I ain't going to say any more. God's ways are nothing like your ways. Isn't it amazing? I've, I'm guilty. I say to God a lot, you know, God, if I were you, I would do this. If I were you, God, I would, I'd, I'd do this with this person. I'd make them better here. And I, you know, I'm telling God all kinds of stuff about folks. His ways are nothing like mine. Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9. Every one of you can quote this most likely. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. This brings to mind a, a story about a gentleman and his family um, from Scotland. Their last name was Clark. 
they had this dream the husband and the wife their nine children they wanted to immigrate to the United States to make that dream a reality they struggled they scrimped and saved finally they managed to accumulate enough money to obtain all the paperwork that they needed to take the trip and to begin a new life in this new land the ship reservations were made the family was ecstatic then as often happens tragedy struck seven days before they were to leave the youngest of the children their little boy he was bitten by a dog the bite wasn't serious the doctor stitched him up and had him ready at, in no time at all but here's the tragedy the doctor had to hang a yellow sign on the Clark's front door the sign was a warning to everybody to stay away because there was the possibility uh, though it was a very small chance but it was a possibility that the boy might contract rabies from this dog bite from an unknown dog their ship was to sail in one week. The family was quarantined for two. They would have to stay behind as their ship and their dreams sailed off into the sunset. The father was outraged. At what he had felt was just unfair, unjust. It was a bad hand that he felt like he had been dealt he went down to the pier to stare at the ship as it set forth. The gentleman was furious at God, frustrated with his son. He cried, he cursed, he stomped. He went home in a foul mood. He stayed that way as well. Then only a few days after the vessel had left port, they got word that on April the 15th, that very ship which has, was to bring them to their new life, it had sunk. The Titanic had gone down. As it disappeared, it had taken their dreams of their, uh, uh, with them, and as it sunk, it took over 1,500 passengers with it. Hearing the news, Mr. Clark's attitude was instantly transformed. He was enthusiastic and eager as he hugged his son plainly powerfully and prayerfully he thanked his God their lives had been spared their tragedy had been turned into triumph we don't understand God's ways they're different than ours trust in the Lord another thing about God's ways is this God's ways are so powerful that even sinners stumble at God's ways Hosea chapter 14 verse 9 says whoever is wise let him understand these things whoever is discerning let him know them for the ways of the Lord are right and the righteous will walk in them but transgressors will stumble in them now I know that's pretty pointed but if we'll trust God and if we'll follow his ways and we'll stay as close as we can to the foot of the cross in doing so we'll be able to keep his ways amen but if we want to sin and live a life that's not pleasing to the Lord if we want to continue just to rebel against God's word in defiance of his holiness then we will surely stumble what are you saying pastor I'm saying God wants to use us but oftentimes we rebel against him rebellion against God is sin do you hear me it's sin the Bible refers to it as as the the sin of rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft what are you saying pastor well why do we fight so hard and stumble and struggle against God just live right walk right and walk in his ways and why is that because his ways are everlasting 
Times change, people change, but God never changes. Habakkuk chapter 3 verse 6 says, He stood and surveyed the earth. He looked and startled the nations. Yes, the perpetual mountains were shattered. The ancient hills collapsed. His ways are everlasting. Folks, what that tells me is, is once God decides to use you, He doesn't change His mind. He doesn't change his mind. Though we would like to try to talk him out of it. There's days we're convinced he was wrong. But we understand he's perfect. His ways are everlasting. Um, I visited Sister Wiley this recently. It was, I don't know if this conversation was this past um, Thursday or one day last week. However, we were discussing... Um, being human I said there are days that I have struggled with God and said God just just let me go just let me go I, I, not that I want to leave the church just, just I, I had a fleshly moment and I'm confessing God if you'll just let me go I'll be the best body man there is <laughs> if you'll just let me go I'll be, I'll, I'll be even more committed to my family. If you'll just let me go. Boy, Sister Wiley cut me off in mid-conversation. She said the gifts and calls of God's without repentance. I said, Sister Wiley, you don't have to quote Romans eleven twenty nine 29 to me. It's like it's etched in my memory. Every time I've told God I'll quit or I'm giving up or I'm throwing in the towel, I see that scripture and it runs in any version I want through my mind. It can be in NIV. It can be the New King James or the King James. It could be the Amplified Version and have parentheses with words in between it. However, I know that I can't get away from it, so thank you for reminding me. His ways are everlasting, people. His ways are everlasting. Um, two things. According to Romans eleven thirty three, 33, it says, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments and unfathomable is His ways. Now, my wife knows me better than you folks do. I tell too many stories on myself, but you know why. She says one day, she says, you know something, I know you're anointed. She says, because I'll listen to you preach, and I'm thinking, how in the world does he come up with that stuff? Thank you for that, that support, babe. <laughs> And, and it didn't bother me. I, it really didn't because I know she's right. I don't make this stuff up. It's not something that I just dream up and, hey, it sounds good, let's do that. These are things that God talks to me about. And it's something he drops in my spirit. His ways and his riches are unsearchable. His ways are unfathomable. In other words, you can't even imagine what he wants to do with you. Did you hear that? You can't dream too big for God. But pastor, this has happened or that's gone wrong or I I've got this. The World Series is being played right now. Was it the Royals and the Giants playing one another? It's bad. I've known him watched enough baseball to know. Those boys make some money, don't they, PK? They get up there to the plate and they'll stand in that batter's box. And boy, they've got different routines. You know, they're either tapping or they're, they're swinging around. They, they're, they're, they're preparing, they're getting in that zone. Man, not, and that pitcher out there on that mound who's equally, or equally as good or better than that hitter is, he's standing in, he's waiting. The ball comes zipping through. And he looked and he took a strike. I have not yet seen one batter after the first strike turn around and walk to the dugout and say, I quit. Not even after two strikes. Though I did see a batter 
that after three balls thrown against him, thought it was the fourth one, threw his bat down, started trugging down to the first baseline, and they stopped him, and I'm thinking, that would be me. <laughs> National TV, everybody's watching. And they said, ho, ho, ho. He looked, he says, what? You got to come back any time for you yet. He said, oh, oh. Then he gets up and strikes out. And even after he struck out, he didn't quit the team. So what I'm saying is, is no matter how bad things are in your life or how they've been, or no matter how bad you miserably failed at your last attempt, don't quit the team. The master has you in his hands. He's got you and he knows what he... My, 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 my. He knows where he can use you. Gonna give you another shop talk for a minute. I have literally took a boxed in wrench and been under something, sweat in my eyes, uh, dirt in my teeth, everything. It was bad. And all of a sudden, wham! And I feel like I tore it off. <laughs> and you're under the car you can't move and you can't throw anything because it just flew out and you can't feel your hand but I picked that tool up after I put the hide back on the best I could went back to work even though it failed me there I didn't throw it away because I knew I'd need it. And I'm not that great at this. If God, His ways are so big, you can't outdream Him. Lastly, why is, why is it so wonderful about the Lord? Because He's just and He's true. Revelations 15 and 3. And they sang the song of Moses, the bondservant of God. And the song of the Lamb saying, Great and marvelous are your works, O Lord God, the Almighty. Righteous and true are your ways, King of nations. He's just and He's true. If you'll trust Him, He'll pick you up and He'll put you to work. And he knows right where you fit. And he knows right how to use you. Can't beat that, can you? He uses the base things to disrupt and dispute the wise. <laughs> wow. The simple. He can use it. So He's talking to all of us, right? Stand with me all over the building. I said it earlier, I say again, I don't understand all of his ways. I'm as human as everybody else in this room. I struggle sometimes. I disagree sometimes, even with the Lord. I got a few of you that'll give me the Lutheran amen and agree. Yeah, me too, Pastor. I know he's right, but I'm stubborn. And I don't want him to be. Because it don't fit how I feel at the moment. So what I have to do is I have to look at his ways. and I have to look at his plan. And I have to say, okay, Lord, I'll stay in your toolbox. I'll be your vessel. I'll be the tool you can use. I won't even argue about when and where. Just use me. Zach sung a song, and I'm not asking you to do it, but Zach sung a song. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. Let it be our heart's desire. Let it be our prayers to the church. God, use me. Wherever you can use me, use me. If it's helping the senior adults, I want to help them. My wife and I was in Walmart, or going into Walmart just the other night. A little lady pulled up in her car, very slow. I was following her, that's how I know. She was taking her time. She was being careful. 
It's a parking lot full of people and cars, buggies, kids. She was being very cautious. She pulls into a spot about midways down those long lines. My wife and I went around and we were able to get a spot and park. And she and I were about to walk past this little lady's car and go into the store. And my wife says, do you think she might need help? She had just gotten the door open and she was trying to make her way out of the car. And when she was coming out, she was getting her, her, her walking stick out. I don't know what the proper terminology for that one was, so she was getting it out. And another lady had come over to assist her at this point. And I said, you know what would be nice? I said, if we could get a team of believers that just love God enough to come up and hang out at Walmart sometimes and find some little old lady that's struggling to get out of her car to say, ma'am, I'd like to help you shop today. I don't want nothing for it. I just want to bless you. Let me help you. My wife says, you reckon why she's not down in the handicap spot? And I said, I probably don't need to mention this, what I said. I said, because there's too many that's not handicapped, that's too sorry to work, and they're too scared to steal, and they're going to go down here and pay a doctor to give them a, a, a piece of paper so they can hang it on their mirror. Makes me want to go up and take their knee out. Pow, pow. Then I get sanctified again and get better. They pull up, doing all kind of move coming out. But I see that little lady, and i got to get saved again right quick. So let me. So if we could just get some people to love God enough, I said, what a ministry. If that was my mom, or if that was my grandmother, or if that was my neighbor, what it would do to my heart and heart to see somebody say, you know what, I, I don't, I, you can keep your money. That's a, you, know, you, 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 you control that part. Let me just help you with the with a gallon of milk that's too heavy for you. Let me, let me help you with a case of water or let me help you with the, the laundry detergent. Just let me help you. You say, well, I ain't never thought of that. Most of us don't. We don't think of those things about the church. We don't think about it because we are too busy thinking about what we're going to get, what we're going to do. Come on. It's what we're thinking of. We're, we're focused on that. What's it going to do for me? Y'all did notice I said some lady had got there to help. I didn't just think of that idea and say, boy, it'd be nice. Someone was there helping at that point. But as we walked around that store, I counted probably 15 more people who were dependent upon their buggy or a cane to keep going. Some of them was wearing World War II veterans hats. They crawled through gunfire for us. Just saying, if you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. But it's not glamorous. You don't get up on the stage a lot doing that. But oh, if you want God to get up on the edge of his chair and look down and smile, you love on somebody that needs help. You be a strong arm for someone who's got a frail body. Anybody with me? If it's your prayer, and I, I'm not going to take much more of your time, but if it's your prayer, you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. Why don't you meet me in this altar and just stand? You come to the altar and just stand. You don't, I don't, you don't have to kneel. If you're not a Christian, then I want you to become one. Jesus Christ died so you could become one. He's not going to do some, some masterful, wonderful, crazy fix. He just wants to save you. And He wants you to love Him. And He wants you to grow. So He's just like a master mechanic. He'll know where to use you. 
He'll know how to take care of you. All we got to do now is just give our hearts to Him and be willing. And I promise you, He'll find a place to use you. That little idea we had about had it at, at the experience at Walmart. There's millions of more. There's hundreds of others. All we've got to do is just say, if you can use anything, Lord, you can use me.